as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliceness, but as the sons, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongly. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto ye were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 23. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Mm. And bishop of your souls? Hmm. Hmm. I've got guardian. I've got overseer. I think it could be elder too. Mm. Okay. Episkopos is the word in Greek. So since verse one starts with therefore, I guess you have to look back on what was the last thought, which seemed to be the word of God, the word of the Lord, the word. So now that you have the word, therefore you can lay aside malice and guile and hypocrisy and evil and envy. Well, you have to go back one more verse, right, Laurie? At least mine, 24, ends with a semicolon, not, not a period. It's not the end of a thought. Right. I went back to verse 22. <laughs> 23 talks about the word of God. 25 talks about the word. Yeah. 23, being born again. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be born again then. We wouldn't need a Black Lives Matter movement if we all did verses 24 and 1, right? Right. 25. And of course, 1 carries on with that comma, to, to be a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word. And, and three is really good. If so, ye have been tasted that the Lord is gracious. So um, I was trying to do a count thing there with verse one, but I guess maybe you answered my question, Dan. Because I was trying to find the, the, the six negative things. But I guess these are really positive things because we're laying aside malice, guile, hypocrisy, envies evil speaking so that's five and as newborn babes we're going to continue that desiring the sincere milk of the word six that we may grow hereby seven and all of that is wrapped in a package with a ribbon that says if so ye be ye have tasted that the lord is gracious you know, you think of newborn babies and the only thing they desire is <laughs> to be yeah. fed. You know, yeah. I, 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 I wish <laughs> for myself that I would have that kind of desire for the word of God. Yeah, but we don't feed them just the sincere milk. Sometimes we give them artificial milk instead. That's right. I like the idea of pure milk. Yes. Mm. The one that God designed to yes. meet all the needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's no middleman. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> it's really beautiful imagery in verses four and five with the, the living stones of a living temple and the spiritual sacrifices. When I think of spiritual sacrifices, I 
think of the literal sacrifice as you you brought the sacrifice because you had transgressed and the sacrifice uh, the innocent sacrifice became took on the guilt of the transgression for you and then that sacrifice was killed and burned and consumed so a spiritual sacrifice would be offering up a sin for god to to consume with the fire of his spirit mm. so i mm. understand i'm sorry go ahead no you go ahead i was just gonna i know that jesus is the cornerstone and i understand that symb symbology i made that word up um but when we become living stones does that mean that we are part of that building up we are the building aren't we of and that contains it all and that makes us living stones we're just built on the one foundation we draw our life from him yeah so can you can you, Cynthia, think of any buildings that we could be a stone of that might be hmm. so many cubics high by so many cubics wide by so many cubics depth? Hmm. Uh, no. The New Jerusalem, remember, in Revelation? Right. right. Hmm. How about the New City? Yeah, I'm ready for that. Not be made up of living stones. Are we not perfect at that time? Perfect character, right. perfect stones. Right. I was living, I was thinking of now, but I didn't, I didn't go far enough. Yeah. Well, it is now too, because yeah. what did Christ teach his disciples to pray? on earth as it is in yeah. heaven. Yeah. So, yes, it's timely. And, you know, you think in the Old Testament sanctuary, there had to be, you know, a priest who interceded. And it's like, now we are a holy priesthood. Also, with the a middleman. Did you say something about a middleman? <laughs> I did. I, I really did. You know, I, I got this image of a mother nursing her baby. There's no one in the middle. <laughs> you know, that's pure milk. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an image person. We take the imagery of the living stones. When, when Solomon built the temple, the scripture tells us that, you know, no tool was heard when the stones were placed in the temple that all the work of hewing and squaring had to happen in the quarry. And that's the same for us in the quarry of this life is where all the hewing and the squaring happens. And then the stone is perfectly shaped to fit in its place in the temple in heaven mm. where, where no, no more work is to be done once it's placed in the temple. Mm temple mm. so i tried to send out a le le link to our group but i don't see that it came through about stones the temple stone Did nobody no I, I i didn't see it jeff i was gonna ask you <clears throat> i actually typed in stones to google and it brought up all the precious stones it's, is he trying to tell me that I owe him for those stones from Florida, or that so there could be, a, or there could be a, or there could be a special one in there? So, did the link not copy over? What happened, Dan? Nothing. I, I I got nothing other than this link, and there was no link there. Okay, let me let me try it again real quick because it will bring. <laughs> For those who are uninformed, last time <clears throat> Jeff and Lori were in Florida, they got us a, a pretty good sized bucket of stones, various stones and shells and stuff. And so when then, then when Jeff sent me this thing about stones, I, I said, okay, well, I'll type in stones in Google. And the first thing that comes up is about, oh, these stones are worth this much. Those stones are worth that much. <laughs> okay, here's a link. I, I must not have hit the paste or something. Mm -hmm. 
So if we if you click on that, if it comes. The longest stone in the Temple Mount. Oh, see, you got it. The references in the scriptures are Psalm 118, 22, and Isaiah 28, 16, about the, the living stone and the chief cornerstone. Lori and I were privileged to visit Israel, and we were able to take a tour of the um, temple. And there was that no longer exists, but they have excavated the foundation stone. Right. So we're going along the foundation stone. And this is this is one of the stones um, that was there. And to go with Craig's point is look how tight when you can see it, how tight those joints are in those rocks. Mm. This rock, this particular one, is 43 feet long. With no cracks in it. You couldn't slide a piece of paper between those stones, and there was no mortar. Yeah. Just fit so perfectly together. It, it was about the size of a school bus. Wow. And they still haven't quite figured out how they got that stone in place hmm. without a crane. <laughs> yeah. They and 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 without chiseling, Craig. It's not like they got it there and says, "Oh, we need to take a quarter inch off over here." No. Oh, let's take six inches off this one here. Oh, that's amazing. That would have been worth seeing. <clears throat> what you have to do is work in it for a little while. You'll understand. Just trying to get a square edge is something else. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. The only way that I've I have truly seen it is with a wire saw. You can do it, but they didn't have anything, um, you know, anything like that. I yeah. worked in the the sandstone quarry in northern New York, you know, for five years, and just the the edges are are something else. You always got to do something to put them together. Yeah, they obviously had some superior knowledge to us. <laughs> we don't even know how they did it. <laughs> <laughs> Some special patience, at least, if nothing more. Yeah. Um, you know, you try to do that with a chisel, and you, you either get a, a not, you get a piece knocked out, or you, you just. Um, so we're living stones, though, but we're still the foundation of God's church, mm -hmm. just as important. Then you carry on into seven. So th this means that <clears throat> we're we're shunned, or so, uh, we're uh, we're disallowed. We're we're made to be. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the word is. Um, most of the world sees us as crazy. Is that is that the way to do it? Disillusioned. Peculiar, I believe, is the positive connotation. <laughs> I like peculiar. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> bite my tongue. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you know, you look at verse nine, and you think, you know, this is kind of what the Jews were called, the chosen, mm -hmm. the royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And now, yeah. you know, Peter is broadening that scope. You know, it's not just Jews anymore. Right. It's Jews and Gentiles. And, you know, the Jews must have gotten a little uptight about that idea. And that's from That's taken from Exodus. 19 hmm. on Mount Sinai oh. and also uh, yeah, Exodus 19 starting at verse 5 now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel and it's repeated in Deuteronomy 7. 
In fact, I'm looking through my study Bible here, and I'm amazed. There's, there's got to be 25, 30 scripture references in just this one chapter. Um, mm. He, he yeah. What's that? He plagiarized. <laughs> well, he's just tying everything together. I mean, it's amazing. It's a lot, you know, how about half of which is Old Testament and half of which is New Testament. Mm -hmm. Jeff, how can the same person plagiarize himself? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm especially happy to see Le Le Leviticus 25 is there. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs> That's verse 11 is connected to Leviticus 25, 23. Strangers and pilgrims. <laughs> Well, we got that in this time, anyway. <laughs> wow. Well, nine, just to do the count thing, there was seven, seven, um, seven descriptions there as well. Hmm. In verse nine? Verse nine, yeah. It shows forth the praises. That's the result of doing these things. And we're called... Yeah darkness and we are accepting his marvelous light hmm. you got to accept hmm. it mm -hmm. and uh, i remember pastor raymond when he first started talking to us he kept talking about darkness and light and darkness and light and darkness and light and they kept talking about the uh the, uh, what is the last let the last feast the light ceremonies yes I did a study last year on the light and the darkness in day four of creation. And it's really interesting when the, the whole context is, is about rulership, about how the sun rules the day and the moon yeah. rules the night. And there's yeah. a whole separating process of judgment happening. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 And I think you see that as you continue to go through scripture when it talks about the sun and the moon, that those are those are emblems of rulership, of authorities of, of the day or the night. Yeah. So I think that link is a lot of times we miss. Mm -hmm. Revelation 12, the woman's clove of the sun and stands on the moon. There you go, yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the Catholic image of the Virgin Mary. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I just saw some, an article about it. It was like the 70th anniversary of the supposedly the, the woman of revelation appeared to some Protestant guy in Italy and it led him to convert and become Catholic. And, was that uh, Major Gori? Some, no, it wasn't Medjugorje. It was something else. It was all about the, the, the woman of Revelation, the prophecy of the woman of Revelation. and There's this whole Catholic counterfeit about it. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I can share it. So you want to decipher verse 10 a little bit? Hosea. Hosea 1 and 2 talks about the in time past when, you know, God had said that you know, his people were so unfaithful to him that he told, told Hosea to marry a, a prostitute, a harlot. And he said, you're not my, you know, and he named the children. One of them was like Loami and you're not my people <laughs> and I'm not your God. But then in, in chapter two, he, he says that he, at the end of chapter two, he, he promises to have mercy and to make us his people again. It's interesting in that passage, he talks about how the northern kingdom of Israel is going to be completely destroyed and he's not going to ever have mercy on it. And that, But that um, the southern kingdom of Judah was the one that he would have mercy because they were the ones upholding the, the truth. The, 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 the oracles of God and the sanctuary were all in the the teaching of the Levites was all in the southern kingdom, while the northern kingdom had completely built the golden calves and followed off the Balaam. But could verse 10 also be talking about the Gentiles? 
they were not a people, but now they are the people of God. Yes. Same principle about being outside of his, Mm. outside the God circle and then choosing to come back inside. (laughs) As Pastor Tim would say. And you see that again in verse 11 about, you know, are you following the beast? What feels good? The feelings? Are you following Mm. feelings or are you following (laughs) principles? Yes. That's part part of called you out of darkness and into light. That's the principle. You could go all the way back to Egypt, right? And he he pulled them out of the darkness of Egypt into his light. Um, even though it was a, a 40 year wandering, it's still a, a they were looking and, and worshiping something other than the Egyptian gods. That's true, but I think you see it over and over and over again once, once you get it. That's kind of the break, the, the, the common denominator, the three angels message, right? Um, light shineth, and then you have to make a decision on what are you going to do with that light, and then there's a reward i don't want to say reward or consequence but then there's a result of what happens with your choice interesting in verse 12 it seems to it talks about the gentiles but so it it seems like before that he's not talking to the gentiles he's talking about the unfaithful israel who's been brought back from destruction and then Because you've been delivered, have your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That they've spoken of you as evildoers, because you probably were, (laughs) but that they now might see your good works and that bring glory to God. Well, you also think of what they were accused of when they were being persecuted. Hmm. You know, they were making and all sorts of stories up about they drank blood and sacrificed their children. Mm. So glorify God in the day of visitation. I mean, you think the day of visitation is... Mm. Right, after that, right after that word in, in up high in little letters is 1984. 1984. What? <laughs> I don't think it's anything. I mean, it's got to be something. It just struck me, you know. Well, we, I, it's interesting that Jesus said about the the scribes and the Pharisees, he said they knew not the time of their visitation, which was actually the time of Daniel chapter 9, told them when the Messiah would come and when judgment would occur. So it's... Definitely connected with judgment and really especially a judgment of the living. Yeah. Craig, the, the 1984 uh, is is the Hebrew and Greek dictionary of what the word visitation is. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you the Strong's number? Yeah. <laughs> yes, oh, I see God. that. Okay, yeah. I appreciate that. Episcopi. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Means investigation, inspection, that act by which God looks into and searches out the ways, deeds, and character of men in order to judge them, their lot accordingly, whether joyous or sad. Oversight, superintendent, and investigative judgment. And we dislike talking about 13 and 14. But you think about, too, you know, how the pattern was of the Jews and how much they fought against the Roman control. Mm -hmm. And that's what eventually brought their total destruction. And so, you know, appreciating that God sometimes puts you in those positions. And like with the Babylonians and the Assyrians. and So we're supposed to break that pattern. 
Well, it's funny that Hosea's name means deliverer, but the two children, the first one means not pitied, and the second one means not my people. I don't and understand just, your question, Cynthia. The children of Hosea? Yeah. Well, she said one was the deliverer and one was the... No, Hosea's name was deliverer. His two sons were not pitied and oh. not my people. Okay. That, that was the meaning of their names. Okay. But Jezreel means God will sow. Hmm. <clears throat> well, they were born of a harlot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yet Gomer means completion. Mm, yes. Because <laughs> God marries the harlot. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting to me anyway that Jesus became personal with women who in that day were stoned and treated like the worst of dogs. And he showed people they were worthy of love. And yet, somewhere along the line, women still, in, in other words, they still bear that cross, or I guess would be the will, of, of being, you know, like if they get pregnant out of wedlock or they're loose or something, you know, they're still the ones that are ultimately the bad girls. Yeah. Not Jesus, anymore. Oh, no, it's coming around. Yeah, it's coming Not around. Not as much as it used to be. Yeah, but back then, you know, his affirming of their sin and their pain and healing them was... If this man were a prophet, he would know what type of woman is touching him. <laughs> right. Well. And his, at his resurrection, he appeared first to a woman. Yeah, I think he definitely elevated the status of women. Amen. In a book that I read, it's called Who Was Who Is This Man? And it lists all of the things that Jesus did to bring people out of bondage and to bring their their class, if you will, to recognition and to um, the positive. And how he freed women from that, um, the way they were treated. Verse 15, by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It doesn't seem like these days anything puts to silence the ignorance of foolish men. No. <laughs> no. Well, it exposes. Mute, sister Sue. I just wanted to know where she was reading that. Over oh, fifteen. 15. You know, you, you keep on doing well, or keep on uh, any one path. Um, it certainly exposes anything that's in opposition to you, wh or whether you're right or wrong. Mm. God will use our well doing to vindicate His name, and He'll. He'll convict many who are acting foolishly. And in 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 the final judgment, you know, they'll they'll be without excuse and silent. And God as God points to all the ways that he sought to reach them. So that's his job, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. To, to make the right choice and leave the consequences with him. 17 is hard to do. Well, wait, go back to 15. Maybe oh, you'll sorry. answer it. <laughs> so are we putting to silence the ignorance of foolish men? It's because of the character of the way we live, right? Yes. I mean, that's what it's all talking about is, is our character and then foolishness is going to be obvious between the two. Okay. I just don't think it is these days. I, I, I think the I think the foolish are so blinded that they either call good people dumb or yeah, I don't know. In, in a final great crisis, God will will bring attention to it in a way that will accomplish the, the fulfillment of that promise there. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, think, think of Daniel when uh, all the, the kings of Media and Persia were looking to find fault in him and they could find no fault in him. Mm. Well, see, that's why I'm thinking this is a three part section. So there's, there's, and that's probably a good example. So you've got Daniel living the perfect life, and then you've got the foolishness of the of the people trying to find anything wrong in Daniel that he, they can and they can. So that that ignorance is silenced by Nebuchadnezzar when he sees through the character between Daniel and, and those judging Daniel. Mm -hmm. So I think I think silencing the foolish men is is the third party looking in, seeing the difference between the two characters, mm -hmm. not necessarily making a stupid man smart. First, <laughs> second, and third angels' messages. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My, Amen. My friend Walter's dad used to say something. I, I haven't thought about it, so I'll get it wrong, but the gist of it is. He who argues with a stupid man, you begin to wonder who the stupid one is or something like that. It's a really catchy little phrase. Yeah. And there's, there's, when I look at, at verse 15, I see there's two things. Uh, that word may, you could use it in two different ways. It may, you may put to silence, but then you might not. You know what I mean? It, both sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. But either way, you're in the right, either side of the coin, if you live by God's principle. Right, and, and you get the first, yeah. And you still die for it. it it's not going it, to, it's still not going to come out good for you in the end. Well, it will come out in the final end. <laughs> well, it's a long time away. <laughs> Interesting in the, the verse 16, uh, as free, as the idea of being free born. And we could think of born again out of bondage. And the word liberty there is, is just a noun form. The, the, the first one is an adjective, and liberty is the same word except root word, except it's now a noun. But it has to do with the idea of liberty to choose. Realizing you're having a choice and now you can make that choice. But don't abuse that choice is what it's saying at the end of the verse. That power to choose. Just because you know you're in the right, don't lord it over people? It's certainly one way, absolutely. Amen. Yeah, well, sometimes, right, you kind of feel like you can take a liberty over somebody else because they're idiots and they make long, long choices. Yes. Like, well, if that's your choice, I'm going to, you know. You know and it's certainly case, not only in the spiritual realm, but it's just everyday life. In the context with verse 17, too, you know, Christ was... As free as any man ever was or could be, but he chose to be willingly submissive to his father. He didn't take that freedom and, and misuse it. He, for the good of others, he chose to be willingly submissive. Well, where were we just reading last week that for, I think it was Romans, for a righteous one might die, mm -hmm. but, you know, so I guess that's kind of where I'm seeing that in verse 16. You, you can tie that into verse 20. Okay. So how do we tie verse 17 in with our current situation, with our frustration of our pastors, our frustration with uh, conference administrators, union administrators, uh, 
you know, it's easy to, to get caught up in not bringing them on, or let's say. You, you have to back up to 13 and submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors and unto them that are sent for him for punishment of evil and for the praise of them that do well. So it's, it's. <clears throat> right, right. It just seemed like 17 was kind of summing, concluding 13 through 17. <laughs> I think it's how you treat them. I mean, you don't, it doesn't say that you should obey them if they're not obeying God themselves, but we can deal with them in a kind and tender and, and loving and patient way. But when um, we talk about them behind their backs in our Bible study groups, is that loving, kind, and patient? I suppose it depends on how you do that. <laughs> If you don't use any specific person, you're okay, Jeff, because it's just general. <laughs> I think I think we need to be aware of reality and what's happening, and yet mm -hmm. you, 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 we don't become judgmental and somehow think now we're better than them because we're just as guilty in plenty of other ways, even if it's different there's, ways. There's a certain respect that's due for their particular position that. Um, as we, you know, as we carry on into the, the thought that, you know, all governments are governing bodies, uh, the Lord is at a part in. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to, I don't know, what is it? Staple your tongue? I, I, I don't know. Um, but there, there's certain, a certain, there's certain honor or certain things that you should do for, for anybody who's, everybody, but certain for those in government who have the, the the credentials or whatever you want to call it for for supposedly being good for you. You can think of, you know, how David dealt with Saul. Saul was, was, was chosen of God and was highly honored of God. But he, he was ruling wickedly and was, you know, under the control and influence of demons. And yet David repeatedly showed deference to him. Mm, he did. I think that's a very good example. Of... Well, the yeah. other one that came up the last week or so, too, was when um, Satan and Christ met after his uh, 40 days in the wilderness. And, and uh, Christ said, I don't rebuke thee what the Father does. I leave that to the Father. So you figure if there's anybody that had any criticism about that Satan, <laughs> it, it would be Christ, right? I mean, he's the reason he's, he's, he's on earth and the whole thing fell apart. But Christ said, I do not rebuke thee. It's not yeah, but he called him out. He called him out, but he didn't rebuke him, did he? He didn't right. get into an argument. He didn't get into theology. He didn't no. tell him that he did wrong. And if he'd done it the right way, what was he thinking? He didn't, he didn't become like the accuser. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Which was a temptation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a great temptation. But yeah. Satan's the accuser of the brethren, and we're not, we're not to be yes. his helper, his helper yep. in that, that work. Goes right. back to verse 11, abstain from fleshly lusts. <laughs> well, that's if you want to chew them up and spit them out. But <laughs> right. But but I but I, I I think it's to be honest with what you're seeing, um, you know. I think and I have called out conference members on things personally. Um, well, you can do that with respect. You know? Absolutely. And I, and I yeah, think, absolutely. You can do it. I think it's the manner in which you do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Are you doing it as an individual to individual or are you doing it to a group of gaining support 
and it gets to them the roundabout way. And that's definitely two different ways. Everyone I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's right. Love isn't just squishy, huggy. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. If you really care about somebody, you're going to let them know when they're heading down a path of destruction that's going to destroy themselves or others. Well, yeah, because you save them from their sins, right? Isn't that what the, yes. the word says? When you that's, a, that's right. Cover a multitude of sins. Yeah, I, I can actually look back in those years and I, was, I definitely had an angry um, attitude towards them. But up in, well, the last five, six years, now I, I, I just pray that, you know, light will be, that they won't put, push away the light because some of them, it is, it is a salvation issue. Mm. Um, and some of them are just, they, they, they really don't know because isn't it when, um, when we're shown ourselves, even the apostles, you know, was it Peter who just said, you know, geez, be gone with me. I, you know, I'm wicked. And yet, yeah, it's just it's just different for me now when I when I when I look at that. I definitely do it in love. With tears in his voice, Sister White said. Jesus mm. gave his rebukes. Yeah. <clears throat> There's also the fact that when he looked in the mirror, what he saw compared to we look in the mirror and what we see. Somebody told me when I was a kid, if you keep on looking in there, you'll see the devil looking back at you. Oh dear. <laughs> Mercy. Oh dear. Get rid of that mirror. Mm -hmm. When we get down to 23, we're getting down to some good news, right? Amen. Interesting when it says, like, honor the honor all and honor the king, it means to estimate or fix the value. We should see all as of value in Christ's eyes because he can redeem them mm. and treat them accordingly. I don't, know, it's, I, we, I don't remember where we had the discussion, but I still, I, I am of the I, idea that anyone can be saved up until the moment of their deathbed. And, um, and so that's why I always be very careful of what you're, what mm. you're seeing because you don't know what's going on in, in their lives. That's right. That's right. It's certainly not for us to try to determine when someone's gone too far. <laughs> exactly. And that this pretty much gets us down to where we started, right? 25, the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And so when, you, when you're thinking about this, um, Peter grew from that death on the cross to writing this. Um, He's mighty in the scriptures and in, in, in his letters. Just say that again, Craig. I said he's mighty in the scriptures in these in writing these letters. I mean, he's again, he's got over 30 references intertwined together, bringing what he's saying here together, and it's all, you know, sound inspired from God's word. And he, he knew God's word. He wasn't just the, the rough fisherman that he had once been. I don't think he's uh, now. I don't think he's the one who rushes foolishly into everything. Like, um, you know, do you love me? I think he might have waited a, a little bit before he answered that to, to seek within his soul. He knew Christ. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting in um, verse 21 when it talks about how he left us an example that we should follow his steps. The word example there is different from other times that the word example is used in the scriptures. This is the only time this word is ever used in the scriptures. It's the word hupogramos, which means a writing copy, including all the letters of the alphabet given to beginners as an aid in learning to draw them. 
So it's a way to learn every letter of the alphabet. So then you can actually write every single word. <laughs> mm. And that's what Christ gave us. And the specific example that it gives is especially focusing on not reviling again, not threatening, and leaving vengeance to God. So it's it's kind of um, idiot proof. Oh, I'm trying to come up with a word, right? You you. It's like you're taking a test and and you're given the answers. It's like here yeah, it is. It's like a cheat sheet. <laughs> it's it's a cheat sheet. Yeah, and here it is. All you got to do is copy this over here, and you succeed. Yes. Yeah, some people can't do it. I know, I invert a few numbers, I'm sure. And there's, there's an example for every letter, for every situation. Right. That's, that's the research and digging, is to find that answer. It's not always that clear. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't need faith. I think this is one of Satan's great temptations for those who are trying to do what's right is when we have righteous indignation, which is right to have, he tempts us to exercise it in a way that's not righteous, that, that dishonors God, to express it. God, God is you know, righteously indignant and is angry and wroth, very wroth, waxing hot, but he's very measured in how he deals with expressing it. Yeah, you never get you never get the sense that he's ever out of control. Yeah, exactly. He knows what he's doing, what he's saying. So, verse twenty-two is all capitals in one version. Mm hmm. You notice that you're right. That's all capitals. Yeah, verse twenty-two. Two. It's not mine. Not in mine. Because it's from Isaiah. Isaiah 53 9. Is it? Yes. I also have 2 Corinthians 5 21 and Hebrews 4 15. So you don't have the 22 is who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. That's all capitals. Really? Yep. Hmm. What version do you have? Yeah. Yeah, mine's oh, italicized. Yeah. New American Standard. It's got Strong's Dictionaries, Concordance, Word Study, Introduction, Footnotes. Yeah, that was right. Well, I guess in Revelation, the deities are in capitals, so this does kind of... Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. It's his character, at least. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a capital character. Well, conveniently, Lori's not going to be here for next Monday's lesson study. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do with her, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're, you're allowed to jump ahead, then. <laughs> are you making an alibi now? <laughs> Ab absolutely. Go for it, Lori. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> but you can have fun discussing it. <laughs> well, well, he'll he's still got to be careful because we have the you know the, the recording of it, so you're gonna you're gonna know what he says anyway. <laughs> Travis is actually graduating. Oh that's wow. Yes. Yeah. And his laws will be there. So yes, it's a big event. Amen. It's it's I, I don't know if it's interesting or whatever as you mentioned it. I got like I don't know how many versions here with Esword, but the new English translation of twenty two um committed no, nor was the seat found in his mouth is all bold print mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and then you know some versions do have the uh the reference to um hold on let me get back there isaiah 53 9. it's interesting in isaiah 28 speaking about the, the cornerstone it talks about Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In the very next verse, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. And the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. So there's a signs of judgment too, right? Yes. The measuring. Yes. Instruments. That's right. Sweeping away the refuge of lies. That's the time of visitation. Mm -hmm. It's also in Psalm 118 which is a kingship psalm, as Pastor Tim would say. Right, right after it mentions the stone in 118, it's, then it talks about, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and hath showed us light bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar so cynthia this is for you and i what you Ex explanation of general format of the nasb um, yeah so we know that anything returning or to the deity are, are in caps but then it says um Small caps in the New Testament are used in the text to indicate Old Testament quotations or obvious references to Old Testament texts. Variations um, of Old Testament wording are found in New Testament citations, depending on whether the New Testament writer translated from a Hebrew text, used existing Greek or Aramaic translations, or paraphrase the material it should be noted that modern rules for the indication of direct quotation were not used in biblical times oh ancient that was all clear isn't it would use exact quotations or references to quotation without specific indication of such that so in short if it's obvious then it was in large cat, uh, small cats, right. because they never, you know, put in the little, oh, I found this and such and such. Right. Yeah, mine is in little caps. Yeah, and there's a few other places I noticed in that chapter that kept popping up. More than half of the New Testament should be in small caps then. <laughs> 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 okay. What was that plagiarism? Is that what I heard earlier? <laughs> I have a quote here from Acts of the Apostles about verses 13 to 17. It says, We are not required to defy authorities. Our words, whether spoken or written, should be carefully considered, lest we place ourselves on record as uttering that which would make us appear antagonistic to law and order. We are not to say or do anything that would unnecessarily close up our way. We are to go forward in Christ's name, advocating the truths committed to us. That would be an important thing for right now, wouldn't it? Mm. I mean, so right Cynthia, now. Cynthia mm -hmm. we could write the whole Bible by verse 17. Mm. Okay, when do we start? Well, we should have started a long time ago, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, because I'm getting old, you know. I don't write so well anymore. You don't look at it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. All the week I was down yeah. there, Sissy kept reminding me that I was an old lady. 
There's also a quote from Prophets and Kings here on 1 Peter 2, 9. In these final hours of probation for the sons of men, when the fate of every soul is soon to be decided forever, the Lord of heaven and earth expects his church to arouse to action as never before. Mm -hmm. those, who have had, those who have been made free in Christ through a knowledge of precious truth are regarded by the Lord Jesus as his chosen ones, favored above all other people on the face of the earth. And he is counting on them to show forth the praises of him who has called them out of darkness into marvelous light. The blessings which are so liberally bestowed are to be communicated to others. The good news of salvation is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. The days of Noah and of Lot picture the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. His working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions for these last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight. To God's people, it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for true sakes. But out of that dark, night of darkness, God's light will shine. Amen. I refuse to be scared. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this precious time that we have each week to, mm -hmm. to consider your word together, Lord. And to build each other up. And to strengthen our faith. And to... Have assurance of your love and of your goodness. We are so weak and erring and prone to wander from your side, Lord. Please keep us, that none might pluck us out of your hands. Yeah. Continue to lead us and guide us in these studies according to your will as our prayer. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.